Since the death of Flash, there has been a swelling wave of interest in Flash preservation, combining many's nostalgia for the games and series they grew up with, with the worry that they may never be playable again. I made an entire video on the subject, detailing the various ways these games are being preserved as best they can, either as is, sold as standalone bundles, or being remastered and remade entirely to ensure generations to come will be able to enjoy our own childhood favorites. But this story takes the idea of disappearing Flash classics much further. The game in question wasn't at risk of being lost at the end of 2020, because it was instead something that had already been nearly lost for 15 years. This is the story of a much beloved niche title and its adorable main character, and the passionate devs and fans who brought this game back from the brink. This is Mission in Snowdrift Land. How's it going guys? My name's Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is Flashlight, the series where I talk about the history of all things Flash related. Mission in Snowdrift Land is a 2D retro style platforming game starring the original character of Chubby Snow, designed as a digital advent calendar, allowing users to log in and play one new level per day. And staying true to the finality of a typical advent calendar, after a six week window of playability, the game was due to be removed from the internet entirely. There was more to it, but I'll save that for a later part of the video. Right away, I know literally a million people have seen the Nick Robinson video on this game, so my own mission here is to attempt to provide additional details, including a closer look at the Mission in Snowdrift Land Kickstarter that just launched, and what these developers hope to bring to their revival of this 15-year-old game that was entirely designed without longevity in mind. I'm sure there will be some overlap with Nick, but I hope I can bring something new as an outside admirer and newcomer rather than a long-term childhood fan like Nick. That Kickstarter is doing really well by the way, it's well on its way to being funded, and we might actually get to see some of the additional content they have planned to expand the game well beyond those original 24 levels. It's running until the end of October, so there's plenty of time left to get involved, but you don't want to miss out on some of those great rewards they have set up. So get on over there and check it out if you're interested. The full title of this game is much less appealing. You Pixo in Action Mission in Snowdrift Land, with UPIXO being the worst shorthand of all time for United Pixel Heroes Organization. That doesn't feel very natural to say, or distinct enough to be truly memorable. It's obvious to me why they stripped that away, and everyone simply calls it Mission in Snowdrift Land. I had been in contact with the developers of the game ever since their first Kickstarter, and they were kind enough to agree to a full interview that will be available on the Two Left Thumbs Patreon. I'll include snippets throughout this video, and will be sure to make it clear what is coming from them. Speaking to that extra-long, you-pixo-in-action game title, we liked the idea of introducing a central company or organization which is responsible for the business and engagement of video game characters. As the name was only shown shortly in the story, we thought it might help to communicate this when we include it in the title. And yes, that made the title long. Mission in Snowdrift Land, as I'm going to insist on calling it, was created by Tons of Bits, which started as an online advertising agency founded by designer Boge and programmer Steve. They had a few Flash game collabs under their belt and decided to start a company together. To clear up some confusion I had that I'm sure others have shared in, Extra Toxic was their company name focused on website design and production, while Tons of Bits is their game label within that. But as I'm sure many have seen, this little Flash game was published by Nintendo. That's really unheard of. Which leads us into our next section. This small indie dev teaming up with Nintendo to create an online Flash game? How does that partnership possibly come about? Nintendo, known for Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, Fire Emblem, Kirby, Pokemon, Animal Crossing, Metroid, Splatoon, Pikmin, F-Zero, and so many more franchises that could be considered the pinnacle of their genre and among the greatest selling games of all time. And Flash games, known for their own genre-defining games like Boobs, Butt, or Shoulder Part 2. Oh, what do you know? It's a shoulder. I kid, it's no secret that I'm a huge Flash game geek and love so much about what they have to offer. They can be a gateway to young developers to start their careers, a sandbox for prototyping, the catalyst of new genres, and paving the way for modern mobile gaming. Well, the good side of it. 
There's nothing in the Flash game world that was nearly as exploitative. But really, what can't Flash games do? Survive a purchase by Adobe, for one. But Flash games and Nintendo have never really gone together. That often, small-dose, quick-fix browser gameplay just doesn't fit in the Nintendo model or brand. Except for a very thin overlap in that gaming Venn diagram, with a few of these small, throw-together, three-level-long, bordering-on-zero gameplay interactive ads, rather than actual Flash games. Mission in Snowdrift Land is seemingly the one real exception, yet it's one of the only ones to not feature established Nintendo characters. It's entirely an original IP. And once the layers are peeled back, it is instead this inverted situation, where the extra-toxic development developers turned what could have been a Mario-like fan game into a totally original independent game that instead served as a delivery system for some Nintendo advertising. There's an interesting full circle that's realized there. Mission in Snowdrift Land and Chubby Snow were designed from scratch. The whole concept was to come up with a suitable game or event for the gaming Nintendo community, therefore being an homage to classic platformers like Super Mario. Tons of bits had been working with Nintendo primarily as web developers before this. Many of these sites were built in Flash, which allowed for animated components and small amounts of interactivity. This wasn't really Nintendo's wheelhouse, and it makes sense that they would contract that work out. As I've discussed before on the channel, Flash game platformers have never been all that good. We have the true standouts that really define that space, namely the Fancy Pants Adventures, but the rest were super generic and didn't feel very good to play. Tons of Bits wanted this game to look, feel, and play at a level that matched the quality of Mario platformers. These devs actually pitched Nintendo the idea of doing the game as an advent calendar. Something revealed in the Nick Robinson interview was that with the substructure of Nintendo at the time, Tons of Bits concept was approved by a subsidiary without the need to run the idea up to Nintendo of Japan. That's something that likely would never happen or never be approved by modern Nintendo. It's a unique case that's fully a product of its time. This small-time German developer partnered with Nintendo of Europe actually did pair off one other time to create Chick Chick Boom. This was also a Flash game, but was further developed into a WiiWare release. This one I actually did know. I remember playing it both as a Flash game and eventually purchasing it for my Wii. I never felt there were enough games that made proper use of the pointing motion control technology, and this was a great excuse to play around with that. This one came after Snowdrift Land, and also ended up having a limited availability, acting as another event game for the Easter season. The Flash version of Chick Chick Boom was taken down after the Easter holiday, but the WiiWare title was available until they shut down the WiiWare channel. These two Flash games that were designed to disappear, and a single WiiWare title that is now gone forever are the only games tons of bits has ever released. It seems to be the fate or curse of our games. Which really we should talk about the actual game. Mission in Snowdrift Land had this cute meta storyline. There's an evil penguin, L. Pix, who has stolen game files from the human world and is now hiding away in his secret lair within Snowdrift Land. Upixco is distraught and don't know whether their heroes can weather the Sub-Zero weather. Whatever the weather, they had better tether their hopes altogether. Okay, I think I'm done with that little bit now. Professor Schwabble overhears Chubby Snow complaining at the front desk because he hasn't been given any good video game roles and wants some higher profile work. I love the idea of firmly establishing that your main character is this underdog looking to prove themselves in the world of video games while working for an organization of heroes. I feel that we've seen versions of that a few times since, but I think back in 2006, that was a fairly unique world setting and approach to introducing your protagonist. There is a Mission in Snowdrift Land Discord server, and I came across some funny questions and discussions regarding Chubby Snow. One of the simpler questions confirms that they are a child and not an adult. One user said that they read the character as being genderless. It's all just snow so it would make sense for the character to be agendered. And tons of bits responded by reminding players, he has a carrot though. <sighs> I think we can all collectively accept that as a joke, move on, and erase it from our brains forever. The game was split into four areas with six levels each, starting on floating chunks of ice, then a forest, 
a frost-covered mountain, and finally Elpix's lair. The Mario influences feel quite clear, especially with World 4 being a lava-filled fiery lair for the final boss. Within each level, there are 24 snowflakes to be collected for you to earn your special rewards. It's not necessary to complete a level to access the next on the following day, but the game included cool incentives, like hiding extra heart containers that would provide Chubby with permanent upgrades. This casual, open approach worked to reward players for coming back each day and playing through thoroughly. That incentive system is really intriguing to me. Each of the four worlds has its own theme music, with three variations each, so that only two consecutive levels ever share an identical track. That's a lot of extra work, but a really cool way to round out the soundtrack and keep things feeling fresh. Classic Nintendo titles are known for precise platforming, collectibles that require you to test your skills, and level designs that give players the opportunity to explore or speedrun, whereas Flash games are generally designed to be more linear and focus on these thin sections of gameplay that allow players to get the maximum experience in a short, coffee break time span. Mission in Snowdrift Land exists in this unique realm, where the individual levels could be played and enjoyed with very little commitment. There's no real obligation to 100% any Thing, as was more typical of casual Flash-based browser gaming. Yet, they made sure to reward more invested players, both with literal rewards and in-game power-ups, asking a little more time and commitment from its players and working to challenge them in ways Flash-only gamers wouldn't often encounter. It became more common years later to create more complete gaming experiences online, but back in 2006, some of the biggest new games were Fancy Pants World 1, Jack Russell, and Ball Revamped 4. While all very fun games, they were designed to be relatively short and satisfying. We were just rounding the corner in the Flash gaming world of much larger projects that could potentially rival console gaming. This may have been a part of that early step in that direction. The balance of Snowdrift Land would have been incredibly difficult to pull off. The game has to be casual enough to play for 5 minutes on any of the 24 levels without a real learning curve, yet it has to feel skill-based enough to encourage players to invest their time and attempt a more thorough completion. These two things are simply at odds with one another, yet they bridge the gap of casual and experienced gamers near flawlessly. With the Snowlog demo of the remaster, I love that title by the way, a few negative reviews came in addressing the slippery controls. I was curious if tons of bits had plans to address this. They shared broadly that it's somewhat a product of the in-game icy environments, but that input lag could exacerbate it and make for unpleasant controls. All in all, we tried to stay as close as possible to the physics of the original game, which naturally contained that slight slippery movement. But as we are players ourselves, we don't like slippery controls at all if it's out of place or just a result of bad programming. So it is something they do hope to refine through game optimization, but it will still exist due to the icy platforms. Any of that slipperiness will ideally be intentional and might come down to player preference. So definitely give the demo a try first and see if the game feel agrees with you in that way. Considering the tight turnaround and bite-sized level requirements for designing this game, the level designs are kind of fantastic. There is a simplicity and accessibility to the gameplay no matter which level, although they most certainly become more difficult throughout. And that difficulty doesn't come just through spamming enemies or awkward placements. There was some real intent behind each level structure, introducing small mechanics and enemy variety along the way. But the way this is done is very smart and very strategic. Strategic. These new elements were always enemy platform or level oriented. They couldn't really layer together new mechanics like double jumps, attacks, or anything else based around player control and input. What if you skipped the level that introduced the double jump, thus missing the tutorial and now couldn't figure out what was meant to be a simple obstacle later on using that new skill? Instead, variety and challenge was added through moving and tipping platforms, new enemy varieties, movements and sizes, and other small tweaks and surprises rooted in the levels themselves. Maybe even smarter than that is the subtle way this game will sort of auto-play to ensure you are never confused or at a loss. Running isn't controlled by a button, it's activated automatically when moving along one of the rare straight stretches in the game. So you never need to be taught this skill, it's there when you need it. Same with climbing on these webs or sliding down slippery slopes. Those interactions are done with a small level of autonomy that both help to engage newcomers, but a assist returning players and free them up to focus on perfecting their platforming. 
which, by the way, I feel is handled very well in this game. Nick Robinson revealed through his interview with programmer and level designer Steve Wells that the game originally went live with only about four levels ready and built. This is where the brain really begins to boggle. This led to essentially every level being made on the fly, and often being uploaded only hours before the intended launch time, after the developers had just stayed up nearly all night to get it done. I asked for this wild story to be expanded upon. As far as we remember, we started in late summer or autumn with the project, so there was not much time for caring about level design, and at that time we were rather focused on game design, graphics, concept, building the code architecture, and making the game playable. Fundamental and basic stuff, so to say. When we were done with all this, we had time to take care of the levels. The first level for December 1st was done and uploaded around 2 to 3 a.m., I think. We'd already received mails from users who couldn't open the level door and were complaining, thanks, or maybe not, to the feedback function we implemented. While working on the next level, we were still fixing bugs for the first level and general engine. All of this was done while working on other website projects. It was a very intense time with long nights and weekends at the office. Surely that level of productivity and excellence in level design comes with many many years of experience, honing your craft and sharpening those sensibilities. I had no proper experience with level design for platformers at the time. I was driven by my intuition, which luckily worked. I was even a bit surprised by the outcome. All the gaming hours I spent in my life paid off for this project. Just wow, that is a genuine shock. Not the answer I expected. Patton Oswalt discusses in his book Silver Screen Fiend how he wanted to make films, and he naively thought that the best way to learn was to watch as many movies as possible non-stop for years. It's kind of amazing that this is an approach that apparently has some merit as a game designer. If anyone ever rags on you for playing too many games, just tell them you're doing research for your own game. Although I'm sure that level design still comes with a healthy dose of talent and keen design senses, things that go beyond just playing games. Bringing things back around to talk specifically about the advent calendar, this concept was used to give players something new to play each day. The game doesn't exist to feed you ads, it's a fun game, and they happen to exist off to the side. There's an overlap in culture here, in that Germany, where the game was made, and Canada, where I live, including the rest of North America, all know this tradition. If it's not a global thing, which I suspect it isn't, and you are uncertain what an advent calendar is, it's an interactive calendar where each day corresponds to a little door. Once a day, from December 1st to the 24th on Christmas Eve, you open that corresponding door and receive a little prize. This ranges from cheap little chocolates to small trinkets and toys, or if you want to go really wild with it, 24 days of beer. At least with that one you have the option to not open a single door until Christmas Eve, and then just in time for the holidays you can be the life of the party. 24 beers in one night is reasonable, right? Mission in Snowdrift Land was designed to be the first video game base advent calendar. You could log back in each day to complete a new level and earn a goodie, such as desktop wallpapers and icons, and my personal favorite addition, ringtones. Ringtones being offered promotionally alongside Everything really is a relic of the past, isn't it? The game was special in its limited time only approach. Rather than existing year round for players to come back and complete, you only had your limited window of accessibility running from December 1st until a final showdown on Christmas Eve. It was made available for an additional 20 days to allow latecomers to catch up before being fully removed from play in mid-January. 45 days, and people are still talking about it 15 years later. I was curious how designing a game built to disappear would have affected the design process or even the morale of the team creating it. Can you imagine if the Lord of the Rings hit the theaters for 45 days and then was permanently deleted from existence? You would have to suspect that a little bit less care would go into creating this finished product. Or if you're a glass half full type of person, you could think to yourself, I only have 45 days to get this out there and make an impact. 
Well, we've always worked on projects which weren't meant to be available forever. As our main business was creating websites, banners, online games, etc., it was always clear that our works would somehow be outdated or removed sooner or later. So, there was no specific strategy or thought put in that fact. The initial release was back in 2006, but it was made available once again temporarily in 2010, that time updated to instead feature WiiWare titles and indie games. For posterity, I wanted to share every game that was featured in these little sidebar ads. Everything you can unlock has luckily been preserved elsewhere. I don't need to double the length of this video by including every wallpaper and ringtone. It still feels worth having it documented here, just to take a peek back at this little time capsule of 2006. But I do want to remind viewers that this is not a true Nintendo game. While it was published by them and used to advertise their products, this remains a tons of bits game first and foremost. Starting with day one, I'll cycle through these fairly quickly. Yoshi's Island DS, Metroid Prime Hunters, Super Princess Peach, 42 all-time classics, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Blue Rescue Team, Sudoku Master, Zelda Twilight Princess, The Wii Console, which would have just launched that year, Trauma Center Under the Knife, Animal Crossing Wild World, Another Code Two Memories, Brain Training, Nintendo DS Light Pink, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, Wii Sports, English Training, New Super Mario Bros. Nintendo DS Browser, Tetris DS, Wii Play, Nintendo Dogs Dalmatians, Big Brain Academy, Mario Kart DS, and WarioWare Smooth Moves. Oh, great game to end on. Absolutely love it. Next, looking at the 2010 indie game version, I was unable to find the exact game files. They were adding new games and titles throughout this 45-day window, and they were forced to repeat a few games as they struggled to finalize agreements with 24 unique developers. If there were fun unlocks to be had behind each door, I could not find them. The documentation of this indie edition is a little less well preserved. Again, starting with day one, sharing the developer and the game they were promoting. They started with themselves, which makes sense. Tons of bits and chick chick boom. Akoni Studio, Zombie Panic in Wonderland. Ronimo Games, Swords and Soldiers, which is probably the WiiWare title I personally played the most. Broken Rules, and Yet It Moves. Over the Top Games, Nyx Quest. Dejoban Games, 1, 2, 3, Kick It. No. Is that how I'm supposed to read that one? Spirit Hunters Inc. Spaces of Play, Spirits. Gaijin Games, Bit Trip. Nocturnal, Flowerworks, Radiant Games, Joy Joy, Two Tribes, Tokitori, Three in a Row were repeats, Amanita Design, Machinarium, another repeat, Press Play, Max and the Magic Marker, V Blank, Retro City Rampage, Cosmonaut Games, Dive, Two More Repeats, Secret Base, Bite Jacker, and one final celebration to cap it all off. All of these inclusions are cool to see, and I really want to share them here now because they will not be a part of the remaster. One, there would be legal issues of including all this copyright material, and two, much more importantly, Extra Toxic has always retained the rights to Mission in Snowdrift Land. As soon as these mini ads are removed, everything left in the game belongs to them. That is why they're able to run their new Kickstarter and pursue a full release of this game, entirely severed from the Nintendo brand. Players of the original game may remember the laboratory, which housed the different unlockables and goodies to be earned by playing through the advent calendar. It has been shared that this is likely to be repurposed as a backer's lounge, to pay homage to those who helped fund the game's full creation through Kickstarter. This advent calendar approach is a core part of Mission in Snowdrift Land's identity. I was curious if the developers were worried a crucial part of that experience would be lost, or fail to translate in a full release. Tons of bits explained that the advent calendar mechanics were used because it felt new and interesting. It was meant to be a hook, not a gimmick, and was never meant to impede the game in some way. Players coming back over and over was a positive consequence of this concept. We know we can't keep up something like this for a full release of the game. Players will pay for the game and they should have the opportunity to play whenever they want to. And they have the confidence to know that the game has a high enough quality to stand on its own without that hook. 
They compared it to the self-control of a traditional advent calendar. Anyone who chooses to can open one door per day or eat all the chocolates at once, at the personal risk of disappointing your parents and the inevitable chocolate-fueled stomach aches. Is it clear these guys like to joke around a lot? You definitely see that in the identity of the game. To offer new experiences and content for the players, we will add challenges you can unlock when you collect all 24 snowflakes in a level, which is already quite tough, especially on the higher levels. With these challenges, even skilled players will get much more out of the game. So what's the deal? How has this game endured to have a 15 year long legacy? Maybe it hasn't been at the forefront of many fans' minds for the entirety of that time, but it's something that has never really been fully forgotten, despite being deleted from the internet twice. Boki shared on their Discord, Mission in Snowdrift Land, like Chick Chick Boom, never was out of our minds and always present. The posters in our office are a good documentation of this situation. We received continuous mails and messages concerning remakes or ports for either game since their releases. So it wasn't a big surprise for us when Nick contacted us. The difference was that it happened during a time when we were sensible for developing another game and our personal situations allowed us to invest some time into a project like this. The reveal of the in-office posters in that Nick video was my favorite part of the whole thing. I wanted to ask them about that. It's wild to think of them privately honoring these characters and that project all these years later. Mission in Snowdrift Land was our largest game project. The intense work and time during production, the details and love we put in the game, the thousands of mails we received as feedback, the huge success in the community, all this left its mark on us. And we needed something to decorate our office with. The remastered version of this game will take that small, square, in-browser screen and allow players to play in full screen with HD graphics in 60 frames per second for the very first time. This will include all 24 levels, including a final end boss battle against L. Pix. They were kind enough to share an early build of that, so I would have footage to include throughout this video. And I can say that the upgrade from Flash to this full version is night and day. Or maybe more appropriately, summer and winter? We have been working on the game since last summer in 2020 and never stopped, so we continued during and after the first Kickstarter, which will happen again with the new campaign. I should probably include a little context on the two Kickstarters. When it became clear that first campaign goal was unlikely to be met, they willingly pulled the plug and decided to reevaluate before trying again. Running a campaign is grueling. You don't just start it and then check back in 30 days later, you need to be active actively engaged with it on a daily basis. And if things are really starting to plateau short of your goal, maybe it's not worth spending every day stressing over it, and things need to be rethought. I wanted to know what their biggest lessons learned were, and how they would apply this to the second campaign. Awareness is key, but you can't generate awareness with a magic wand. You can try to reach out to media, streamers, etc., but there's no guarantee anyone will be interested in your project. In our case, we revised the rewards and tiers, and noticed that there actually was plenty of room for optimization. We wanted to make the tiers and items as attractive as possible and offer our community really fair packages. So we came up with new items and compilations content-wise and price-wise. This time around, they are also taking on significantly more risk, literally having their funding goal well below the actual costs of developing the game in the hopes of longer-term success. They are already developing this game entirely out of pocket. The focus of the Kickstarter is now instead to give back to their community, embracing this as an opportunity for a direct connection between developer and player. Compensation for the work they've already done feels like a welcome bonus. That funding goal may feel awfully high. I mean, this game is already complete, right? How could they possibly ask for this much money to simply port their game? As a starting point, the vast majority of the game needed to be remade from scratch. You see, the thing is, 15-year-old games made for browsers in an engine that is no longer supported tend not to age well. The character and enemy art are the only graphics which are taken from the original game and scaled up in the engine. We wanted to keep the pixel art for those, and it was technically possible to do without significant losses. Basically, all other graphics are remade from scratch, especially the platform textures and background graphics. Some of the original artworks could be used as a base for new ones like for the map, but we still had to retouch them, otherwise 
ugly pixel blocks would have resulted from upscaling. Switching back and forth between the original and remaster with that in mind, it's actually wild what a difference those updates have made. It's so apparent now how much has been redone from that original version. I'm sure fans will be eager to know, is their intent with this remaster to preserve the original experience as much as possible, or instead use this additional time and design expertise to expand, rework, or refine the game? It's a mix of both. On the one hand, we definitely want to preserve the original experience, including all the details players of the original version will remember, giving them flashbacks and making them think, yes, that's exactly how it was back then. There's this idea of preserving something how players will remember the game, rather than precisely how it was. It's something Brad Bourne and I have kept in mind while working on the Fancy Pants Adventures Classic Pack, which, by the way, available to wishlist on Steam now. Maybe check that out as well. Then, on the other hand, we love the aspect of having much more possibilities now with the current technology and hardware available. For example, playing Mission in Snowdrift Land with a controller is one thing which wasn't possible with the environment of the original version, though a platformer is the classic game type for this kind of control. Or having the game in full screen in high resolution adds so much more to the feeling of immersion. Same goes for higher performance, which makes the game run smoother. For example, the backgrounds are scrolling now. They were static before due to performance issues. Additional time allows us to polish or add parts which got lost or were produced as a compromise, like the background graphics, cloud platforms in the mountain world, and different textures for each world. So while the game will remain fully familiar, there is plenty to be changed. And I have it on good authority that once this game reaches its 100% funding goal, they'll be announcing their very first stretch goal. They're very aloof they weren't willing to share what that would be, but considering the trajectory this campaign is on, they might possibly be funded by the time this video goes live. So it's not too late to get in, and maybe we can start pushing this game towards being bigger than it's ever been. Boki has shared his desire to eventually bring the game to consoles, especially the Switch. It would be so amazing to see a game once loosely connected to Nintendo make its way onto their newest console. That's the true hero's journey Chubby Snow has always been seeking out for 15 years. When asked about mobile releases, that's something the team has put lower in their priorities. Coming from their Discord, I personally don't think platformers work well on mobile devices due to control mechanisms. Playing platformers with touch control is a pain and destroys a lot of game experience in my eyes. Maybe you guys can recommend some mobile platformers that have done this well, that the Tons of Bits team can learn from. Actually, while we're on recommendations, I asked these two if they had been inspired by modern platforms platformers in the years since 2006, and if any of them would in turn influence Mission in Snowdrift Land's remaster. They both admitted that their platformer experience is largely limited to the Nintendo classics, or some modern interpretations like Tropical Freeze, and that it's hard to imagine others building on what they kind of see as perfection. So please also share some of your favorite modern platformers in the comments as well. It's kind of special and amazing that Snowdrift Land gets to exist frozen in time, connected to its roots and influences back in 2006, but I see no harm in potentially introducing them to a few new titles as well. Beyond all those original core features and foundations, there is so much left to be done. The game was actually not done. Not at all. It makes sense with what a time crunch they were on. The gameplay and design already worked, so we didn't have to invest time coming up with a concept or game idea, though we of course had to wrap it in a new logic because the story and reward concept didn't work anymore. They have visions of possibilities to expand the game that include challenges to be unlocked upon 100%ing a level, additional secrets to be found, and a remade and retold story with additional content that could be added to the game long term through patches. I thought I would ask if they had a list of dream features, if they were somehow granted unlimited funding. From Boge first, I love to play co-op, so given unlimited funding I think adding at least one preferable up to three characters you can play together with Chubby would be the first thing which comes to my mind. Of course, new worlds and enemies would be nice too, but this is actually doable with limited funding. And from Steve, when I start to fantasize with the situation of unlimited resources, my brain is overwhelmed after a few minutes and I have to cool down. I see the limitation of resources as a gift. To be forced to focus on core elements is vital to finally finish a game. Which he has a good point. Feature creep is a far too common problem, and as doomed 
many games. I was excited to cover this story because of how uplifting and positive it all is. That a community could rally behind a game that was available for a collective 90 days over the last 15 years and remember it fondly enough to be willing to put their money where their mouth is and bring this game back to life. It's also very touching to think of these developers pouring everything into this game, having it remain so dear to them for all that time, and going above and beyond to make this ideal version of this passion project come back to life. While I'm not someone who grew up with this game, I really have enjoyed my time with it, and have grown a little bit of my own attachment to this goofy little hunk of snow. So if you're interested, be sure to check out that Kickstarter, help this game be the best it could be, and if you have other long forgotten, cherished games in your own mind, it never hurts to reach out to those developers and let them know how special it was to you. Who knows what might come of it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you consider yourself a major fan of platformers, especially web-based Flash platformers, don't miss your chance to get involved with this Kickstarter. I'll also have a link in the description for you to wishlist the Fancy Pants Adventures Classic Pack. I don't want to entirely steal Snow Driftland's thunder, but they really do have a lot in common. Above and beyond Flash game platformers that released back in 2006, being revived for a new generation? Yeah, how can I not bring that up? I also have a full mini documentary on the history of the Fancy Pants series. I'll include that in the end cards if you want to check that out next. Thank you to patrons of the channel whose names are scrolling off to the right, and I'll see you all again soon.